Hey, Yuri, my friend, how are you doing today? I'm awesome, Sachin. How are you? I'm well, thanks. I'm really excited for our conversation. Uh, now that I've hit record, we can we can dive right in. Uh, for those of you that don't know Yuri, he is uh, kind of prolific in the athletic world, but also in the health and entrepreneur space as well. I actually met Yuri at a conference I went to that Peter Osborne was hosting, and he got up on the stage, walked up there, knocked out of the park, and of course, I come to learn that he's from Toronto, literally right down the street from where I live. So after this, at some point, we're definitely going to have to get, get together, my friend. It's great to see you. Yeah, totally, dude. Uh, and thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. And dude, I, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the wisdom you share. And uh, for, I mean, anyone watching or listening to this, like you guys are in amazing hands with Sashin because you're one of a kind. So I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited for our conversation. I know you've been coaching hundreds of practitioners and practices and have sold hundreds of millions of uh, dollars worth of services through the the, the knowledge and the the uh, protocols and the processes that you guys have put to play, uh, put put to put in place. Uh, not only do I want to talk about that because I know that's going to be really helpful for entrepreneurs because I'm sure you've learned a ton uh, in that journey, right? About what personality. Uh, really does well with you know with getting functional medicine out to the masses or just wellness services out to the masses. Who should perhaps consider being an employee or working for an organization that they admire versus starting and, and trying to run their own business? Because we all know it's it's challenging, right? I think both you and I have done this long enough to know that it's not easy. Uh, sometimes it's not going to be very fun. However, it's worth it. And some of us. Uh, probably like me and you are unemployable. So we can't go work somewhere else. We just don't Very have the much. personality uh, to be able to do that. So uh, before we jump too far into that, uh, what I'd love to have you share is how did you get into the health and wellness space? What inspires you every day to get up and, and make sure more people are healthy and happy? Yeah. So I grew up wanting to play pro soccer. So from the time I was 10, I was like, that was my vision. So I dedicated my whole teenage existence to training, playing, competing. And I was able to eventually play pro in my early 20s. But when I was just about 17 years old, I lost all of my hair in the space of six weeks. I was like, whoa, like what the heck just happened? And so I, I had an autoimmune disorder uh, or alopecia. And it was a real like wrench in because my dad is Moroccan. So I had more hair than you do in terms of like mm. facial and eyebrows and a whole bit. So it was, it was an interesting transition my senior year of high school to go from that to six weeks later, looking like I just went through chemo. Hmm. So what, the uh, combination, what's that? Sorry, I have, I have to stop you there. So, cause I've, I've, this is how I've known you and yeah. this is how you've known me, right? With no hair on top of my head. So I'm like, so curious now, uh, when you say you had thick hair, you know, th thick beard and everything like Talk me through that because that's got to be, uh, that can't be easy to go through something like that, especially at that age, right? People can yeah. be really cruel and, and we can sometimes be even crueler to ourselves. So maybe you can yeah. unpack that a little bit for me. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of people ask that same question, like, you know, it must've been really hard. And I, in my maybe convoluted memory of it, I don't actually think it was as hard as some people might think. Um, I don't know why, maybe I just had... A bit more perspective at the time to say like it's only hair i mean people have way worse and mm. and yeah like obviously there's you know it's kind of weird to have like a bald patch on your head and going through all that stuff so i also had a good group of close friends who it wasn't they didn't even consider it like whatever it's just yuri it's just what it is right so i think i had a good support network that helped me through that and i was i was never really like there's no bullies that i was aware of in our school. So like none of that really happened. So I think I, I went and navigated that pretty well, but that event was one of the best things that ever happened for me because that really started to open my eyes to like, oh, maybe there's something going on with my health that I'm not aware of. Like I was fit, but I wasn't healthy. Mm. And I didn't realize that until that happened. So that kind of opened up the door into exploring different options, right? Conventional medicine, dermatologists, you know, immunologists, blah, blah, blah. And I started getting introduced to some amazing alternative practitioners, whether it was, you know, TCM, naturopath, et cetera. I did, you know, everything. Uh, and, and my mom was very gracious in that process because I was only 17. So she's the one driving me all over the place and nothing really worked, but it was okay. Cause I started to just be exposed to that. And I just said, okay, well, you know, it is what it is. And kind of went about my, my journey and, and eight years later, so I had gone through 
kinesiology and health sciences at the University of Toronto, uh, played pro soccer after that in France, and then came back after I retired at 24, 25, and decided to pursue studies in holistic nutrition. And that's when my life changed, because in the space of one day, I was like, oh my God, I, I was being exposed to information I never even knew existed, going to one of the top universities in the world. And I thought to myself, well, what if I just started applying this stuff? And that's what I did. So within about two months of actually applying, like cleaning up my diet and all that stuff in university, I was able to regrow pretty much all my hair. And I still don't have any hair, but that's an, another story. But the idea was like, I saw such profound change and more for me was about like having so much more energy because for most of my life up until that point, I was exhausted all the time and I never made the correlation until, you know, all of it happened and I learned. So I'm about 25 years old and I was, you know, working with personal training clients because I wanted to get more exposure practically to what I'd learned in school. And then I thought to myself, well, the nutrition stuff can be a great compliment. And I, you know, I did that for many years. And then I realized I'm like, man, there's so many more people out there that could benefit from this information. I'm like, if I didn't know this stuff and I played pro soccer, I went to one of the top universities for health sciences and I didn't know this stuff, billions of people, you know, mustn't know either. And that's, that really set me on a mission. Like I was like hell bent. I actually wrote my first book in the back of nutrition school. Like I was in the back of class starting to like write my book out. And that eventually about eight years later became the New York Times bestseller, The All Day Energy Diet. And it kind of just, I'm just like a high quick start. I just wanted to get things going. So my, 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 my passion for wanting to help others came from my own struggle, which is why I love serving our industry because pretty much everyone has gone through their own journey, whether it's, you know, weight issues, gut issues, skin issues, whatever it is. And I struggled for many years uh, as a one-on-one -on -one trainer, nutritionist, trading time for money, overworked, underpaid, doing that for seven years. So I was like, I can't keep doing this. I have a bigger vision. I want to help more people. And so I came online in 2005 and I thought I could figure it out by myself. And that didn't happen for three years. So I made little to nothing and eventually got out of my own way and, and hired a coach. And that's when things started to take off. And I was at the time when I came online, I was just selling like nutrition programs and workout programs. And I didn't know what I was doing. I had no plan, no roadmap, nothing. But eventually when I got mentorship and coaching and guidance, I was like, oh, and then the business really took off and we went on to build something pretty, pretty substantial. Uh, we went on to help half a million people to better health. I eventually sold the company 13 years after I'd started it. And during that process, a lot of people in our space started coming to me for business advice. And I was like, hmm, maybe there's a gap in the market here. And that's where Healthpreneur, which is our current company, started uh, about seven years ago. And it's interesting because it's all come full circle because one of, you know, I don't want to say like I'm a martyr, but I feel like I really truly care about serving others and helping these like unbelievable health practitioners. And you know them too. Like they just have this gift to transform lives like no one else. And no one knows who, no one knows who they are, right? They don't know how to get their message out. They don't know how to... Uh, to shine their light because they're maybe afraid of what other people are going to think or, you know, whatever. And I thought to myself, well, if I could do my part in helping them build better businesses, then ultimately we can achieve our mission or our vision of helping a, helping a billion people on the planet improve their lives in some way, shape or form. And I knew that I couldn't get there, me direct to consumer, but I thought if I have these skills and capabilities to help other practitioners build better businesses... Um, and our philosophy has really just been more virtual than brick and mortar, and then they can help more people and collectively we can reach that goal. So that's that's really been my journey and that's why I do what I do. And I, I fundamentally, like I love business. Like I really enjoy the game and figuring things out and the ups and downs. But I, I, I truly, truly, like, and I've actually cried on some of my coaching calls talking about this stuff. Like I truly care about helping people stand in their power shining their lights, becoming the best version of themselves so they can share with more people. And that's that's why I'm that's what that's what I'm here to do. That's why I love doing what I do. And even though I don't have to work hard, I work hard because it's just it's just so much joyful. So much joy. Good to have something that drives you every day and and inspires you and 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 pushes you forward. Cause when we're lacking that, that's where I feel a lot of fatigue sets in, where inertia sets in, and it's really hard for us to get out of bed even sometimes. You you hit on something that 
I think is really important for us to address uh, kind of the elephant in the room because people who are listening to this are are those practitioners, those passionate passionate practitioners that you know really perhaps have taken a handful of people through their process, have seen the transformations take place. Maybe they've had their own personal transformation and they want to do that for others. But you know, I've seen this and and perhaps you've seen this as well. People just get stuck, like they almost get in their own way. So I'd, I'd love for you to perhaps unpack what what comes up. Uh, when you encounter that person yeah. who's who's kind of floundering at putting their message out there or struggling to to really lean into what they have to offer to the world. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunately, it's all too common in our space. And I think part of it is that, and, and I can't speak for everyone and I can't speak for every vertical or industry, but I really do think that there's some mindset blocks that health professionals have that really keep them small. And I say small in, in the word like, literally small. We all want to impact more people, but the reality is if you can't sell your message and services to people, you're not helping many people at all. And one of the things that I see come up over and over again, and, I, and I've shared this uh, many times, is that the need to be liked is one of the biggest obstacles to growing your business. And how this shows up is, oh, I don't want to post too often. I don't want to email my list too often. I don't want to lean into a hard conversation. Why? Well, because they might unsubscribe. They might send me a nasty email. They might say F off. They might say you're posting too much. And all of that is about pleasing someone else. It's worrying about the few people who weren't going to give a damn anyways. Instead of you saying, I'm going to shine my light so bright that I'm going to blind those people. And in the meantime, I'm going to inspire others to be who they can be or you know whatever is important to them. So I think the need, the internal feeling of being liked by other people, I think holds so many people in our space back. And I was one of those, like I, I hated sales. Like I was horrible at it when I started as a trainer nutritionist. I was charging 20 bucks an hour. I felt so awkward asking people for money because I thought I was actually taking something from them only to recognize that even if I charged a thousand dollars for a two month or three month package, I was going to transform this person's life. Now a thousand dollars. I'm like, you have, you have a thousand dollar iPhone, right? Like let's just put things into perspective. So I think for me, I've gone through a lot of the stuff that like our audience obviously deals with. And I've gone through the journey and the imposter syndrome and all this, this mindset stuff. But I think like what other people think of us is one of the big things that holds us back. I think another thing is there's some major money mindset stuff happening in our space. And again, I'm guilty, right? I was in that, like I was living on six, 12, $18,000 a year when I started my business online. Before that, I was making $20 an hour as a trainer. At one point, I was making $80 a week. And so I'm sharing this from like having gone through the journey. There's this really weird, and I think it's actually a poisonous mindset to no fault of anyone in our space. It's just what it is. That healthcare should be given to others almost for free. And I think that is an absolutely horrible mindset to have. And again, I'm not blaming anyone. It's just, if you live in Canada, you've got public health there. If you live in the UK, you've got public health care. In the States, it's a bit different. But we, I mean, there's just so many people who don't take responsibility for their own health in general, that they think the doctor is responsible. Like, I'm going to delegate my health to someone else. And I think there's just tens of millions of people who live in that world. And when a practitioner says, well, I don't charge $75 a session. I charge $3,000 for a package or an outcome. Some people have an issue with that. How dare you make health inaccessible? No, no, no. It's not about that. It's about helping you understand that you're not going to do anything unless you pay. Right. And this is why I fundament fundamentally have an issue with certain metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes. I've worked in that space for a long time. And unfortunately, that's a lifestyle disease that is 100% self-inflicted. And for someone to go from like, I'm about to have my leg amputated to transform who they are is slim to none. So why is it your job as a practitioner to, to give handouts to people like this? Give them a hand up, not a handout. And sometimes the people who need your help the most want it the least. So how this shows up is we undercharge, we give away our services for free, we work ourselves to the bone because we feel like we have to be a martyr in the service of other people. And then that leads to the number one problem we all see, which is burnout. 
right? In any service-based business, burnout becomes the biggest bottleneck on the delivery side. So if you're dealing with patients and clients all day and you have to market your business and deal with charting and admin, et cetera, it's impossible to get ahead. And it's so unfortunate. Like there's so many amazing health practitioners that are just scraping by. And part of my mission with, with, with what I'm doing on this planet with healthpreneur is to help health entrepreneurs or health practitioners make their dreams happen in the service of other people. We've had clients that do million dollars a month and, and people like that, they must be scamming people. There's no way they can be doing good. And I'm like, you have no clue the good that they're doing in the world. Just because they're making a lot of money, just think of the tens of thousands of people they've transformed compared to the person over here who's undercharging and doing nothing. So I think there's, you know, a little bit of a mindset issue around when it comes to like being compensated for the value we're providing to others. So those are kind of like two things I see as like these pervasive weeds in our minds as, a, as an industry that I think they just take time for, for people to think through and, and recognize and stand in their power. And, and, you know, hopefully we do a, a good job at, at moving them through that. Yeah. The money one is, is so pervasive. Um, not just the mindset about giving it away because it's, it's healthcare. And it's interesting what we call how we what we call healthcare, right? Because yeah, exactly. I think I think everyone on this call recognizes that it's not that. And you know, I am a firm believer, just like you are, that paying for something, you know, you pay more attention to it. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people will come up to me and say, "Do you ever wish your services were covered by insurance?" And I said, "The moment it gets covered by insurance, or the moment people don't have to pay out of pocket, is the moment the results go." Uh, for the most part out the door yeah. because when people just um people can't just delegate that responsibility to somebody else they've got to own it and when they invest they own it the thing that you said about the money mindset do you think that's something from childhood something that was modeled to people like when you when you work with your clients to help them correct that money mindset uh, are there any special tools or resources that you provide them with is it conversational is it coaching is it plant medicine, like what helps people kind of- We do ayahuasca shift. ceremonies. Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't. Um, so where it comes from, it probably comes from like with all of us, like conditioning from our parents, our school system, the the zeitgeist at the time of doctors or the trust, you know, whatever, you know, every, everything your doctor says you should trust and they're good and, and whatever. So I think that's, that's kind of where a lot of it starts. But then, you know, moving into the actual- and I don't know, I mean, I don't know how much has changed actually through school because I mean, it's been 20 years since I've been in school now. So I don't know what the the dialogue is around. I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, I didn't get any business training in school. So the conversation was non-existent. So you're a practitioner who gets a degree and then is like, what do I do? Well, let's look at what other people are charging. And then it's almost like, well, if he's doing that and she's doing that, let me just, I guess I'll do the same thing. So I don't know where it comes from, but I do think there's a lot of like monkey see, monkey do type of stuff out there. And then I think part of what I really get joy out of helping my clients really move through is really, really getting them to recognize the value of what they do. Like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think, and I don't think I'm biased in this. I just think this is an objective truth. I don't think there's any other profession in the world that impacts lives like we do, right? You have a plumber, cool, fixes a leak. An accountant, cool. No one can save your life like a health professional can. So you're going to pay, what, $700 for legal advice per hour, but you can't charge that as a health professional? Why? Well, because, and it's just about asking why. Like, well, because... Some people believe that healthcare should be accessible. And I see this with clients all the time because our recommendation is charge premium prices. The people who can and are willing to pay for that will transform their life. And then everyone else, you can just give away whatever information you want for free. And eventually more of those people will come to work with you. So what happens is they start speaking with prospective clients. And then the client's like, well, it's, it's, it's more money than I wanted to spend. And that happens over and over again. And instead of skilling up, what they default to is maybe I should offer something lower end to help everyone else. And it's like, well, why would you do that? Because you're going to complicate your business. You're going to attract worse people who are actually not going to show up to your point. 
And that's like, if we're in the business of transforming people's lives, the best thing we can do is charge a premium price. There's everyone talks about passive income. I want to sell a course online. The average completion rate of a course online, this is without accountability and coaching is 3%. So if we are, so this is like as health professionals, if we truly care about helping someone go from A or like sick to better, whatever it is. And if they don't even complete a course that we gave them access to to do on their own, how are we actually helping them? So my my mindset, and this is what I share with our clients, is like, and and just in general in the market is like, if we, tr- it's not even about the money. It's about if you truly care about helping someone transform, you are actually doing a disservice to them if you do anything other than charge a premium price. And the more you charge, it's not about like, again, when I say like a premium price, I'm talking in the neighborhood of like two to five thousand dollars for an outcome. We're not talking about buying a five hundred thousand dollar house. And I remind people all the time, like when anyone says that your $3,000 package is a lot of money, just ask them, have you ever been on a vacation? Person says, yes. Well, that was probably more than $3,000, wasn't it? And it's always just a clarification of values, right? Where we spend our time and money. So if you have a $1,500 iPhone, if you have a flat screen TV, if you have a car in your driveway, those are all more money than most people's coaching programs yet. When someone says, this is too expensive, I need to think about it, talk to my spouse, they actually think there's something like they have to change in their pricing when the reality is like you can get better at having these conversations to help people recognize this is just not that important to you, right? If you think that a $20 diet book is going to change your life, like you're, you're delusional and some people have to go through 100 diet books before they get to that point, but you know, we don't have to serve everyone. Like it's not your job to cater to everyone on the planet. Like you have to be very clear about who you want to work with, who would be a joy to serve, who could you produce the best results for. And if some people are not ready to step up to that level, that's great. Like wish them all the best, support them however you can for free with content, whatever. But, you know, it's, it's, it's recognized like, man, like you have, you have magic, like we're alchemists, you know, that can really, really transform people's lives. And how do you put a price tag on someone who's been dealing with weight issues for 20 years and they're telling you $2,000 is too much money. Like it doesn't make sense to me. And this is what I continually like just infuse in people's minds. And hopefully, you know, we're able to, to, to get enough people to understand that. And I ultimately think that's going to help a lot more people because just to finish this point, you could say, okay, at a macro level, if everyone started charging premium prices, then no one's going to be, have access to that which could be true. But the flip side to that is if you build a business that has way more profit and margin, you can do a lot more with that. So it's not to say that you can't help everyone else, but if you can't help yourself, you can't help anyone. So if you built a business that was like, you filled up your cup, well, who's to say that you couldn't take some of that and then give it to everyone who can't afford your services in some way of giving back, providing to the community, you know, but you can't do that stuff if you can't even fill up your cup in the first place. Yeah, I think a lot of us have this altruistic mindset. Yeah. And it, it backfires because it comes at the expense of our own health and our own self-confidence in in us building our business and and of course reaching and, and impacting more people. And I and I love a few things that you said, you know, giving people a hand up instead of a hand out. I uh always love when I hear people say that because it just sets the right tone for where the energy is coming from. Yeah. You also said something much earlier that I want to come back to, and that was it took you a few years to to hire a coach. And so there's kind of a couple parts to that question. One is is being a professional soccer player, you probably had a coach the entire time. Just a few, yeah. Uh, so you obviously saw the value in that, but what what took you so long to hire a coach in your business? And, and, and how did you go through that vetting process, having had many coaches to identify who was a good coach to work with? Yeah, so it's the whole, like the, the big answer and the simple answer is very small thinking, mm. right? I don't want to pay. I can figure this out by myself. And I see this mindset still with many health professionals, which is very interesting considering they drop more than six figures on their education typically. So you spend six figures on your education. Then you start to build your business for free by watching YouTube videos, by taking a free challenge and not actually investing in some type of mentorship. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. But I was that guy, right? So I get it. Like I thought I was 
smart. I could figure some stuff out, but I didn't. And the reality is if you're not where you want to be, you're not good enough. You don't know some things. And the best thing you can do is find someone who's been there. Because the thing is, and I ask, this is this is the asset test. I'll ask people, what do you value most? Your time or your money? And every single person's like, my time. I'm like, okay, we'll see. Because we will spend what we value least. So if you say your time is most valuable and you're not willing to invest, like let's, I'm not saying like just throw money at stuff, but if you saw someone, a mentor, a coach, whatever, that was like, that person has what I want. They have a roadmap I can follow. It's a little bit out of my price range. It makes me a little bit uncomfortable. By the way, that's a good thing because it's probably really good. So if you all say that time is the most important and then you're not willing to trade your money to buy back your time, then what you're really saying is what's most important to me is my money because then I'm willing to use my time to get where I want to go. And I don't know how you can really refute that logically. And this is this is the thing for me because you either have a lot of money and less time or you've got a lot of time and little money. In some cases, you can have both. But generally speaking... There's really like, you know, whether it's hiring a coach or the type of business model you want to run for your business, whether it's paid traffic or organic, whatever, people think that like posting on social media is free. I mean, it kind of is, but it costs you the most because it costs you the one thing that you never get back, which is your time. So there is a time and place to do that. I, I get that. But if you are not willing to pay to play, whether that's running paid traffic or hiring a coach, then you can't say that your time is the most important thing to you because that's the thing you're trading every single day to get where you want to go. It's going to take you 10 times as long. I don't think I got that for a long time. And I challenge people on this all the time, right? Because we're all burnt out. I mean, you know, health professionals in general. And it's like, we want to buy back our time. But then there's like this insecurity around investing in the growth of the business. Yet, we'll go get another couple letters behind our name. We'll go back to school for another certification. And where is that coming from? The fear of I'm not good enough, that I have to have a couple more accreditations because if I don't have this, then whatever. Or is it the fear of actually putting yourself into the trenches and having conversations with potential clients who might say no to working with you? So a lot of it's like, a lot of it is like getting ready to get ready, getting ready. I got to get my program ready. I got to get my curriculum ready. No, you don't. It's so funny. I don't know if you run into this section. Like when, when you're a practitioner in your clinic, someone walks in, you don't have a curriculum. You just work with them. And then we come online and it's like, well, let's put the brakes on. I got to get my program ready. I got to get my curriculum done. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. I have a client who's like right here. He's going to pay you $3,000. Should I just tell him to wait for a couple months? And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, no, I can work with them. Exactly. Just work with your clients and you'll build the bridge as you go. And it, it, it's also another way I see this is like you have a practitioner who's in their brick and mortar. They serve a five to 10 mile radius. And then they come online and all of a sudden they recognize they can't serve people outside their province or state. And then that becomes an issue. It's like, hold on, you weren't going to serve anyone outside of a 10 mile radius in your brick and mortar. But now all of a sudden you have to serve everyone across the world. Isn't California with 30 million people big enough? So there's just like these weird mindsets that we have around this stuff. And and I took, sorry, I kind of forgot the initial question where I'm going with this, but um, oh, gee, I'll just what, stop what, what talking. Inspired, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, I love it. I love what you're saying. Like you, a lot of ninja stuff in there. So if you're listening to this, I would suggest kind of rewinding it and, and processing uh, the gems that you just dropped or that Yuri just dropped. Um, I love I love that you uh, you know just help help people reframe what's important and you gave them uh, uh, kind of a o- almost like you tied them in a knot and now they can't escape. Like you'd have to yeah. like their brain would have to break for them to answer that question incorrectly. So uh, love that. I love how you reframe that for people. I know that people love to be liked, right? And especially in an online world there, where where people are so afraid of their reputation going downhill very quickly. Maybe they've seen a horror story or heard of a horror story. Does that ever, how often does something like that happen? I, I know there's, I'll say from my personal experience, there's been the odd time where you get a bad review. 
Yeah. And most of my bad reviews are from people who've never actually even used my services. So I don't it's know where true. these people yeah. come from. Yeah. But I'm curious, like, uh, do you encounter that where people are afraid to like get so big and sh shine so bright because now they may, may feel like a target? Huge. Yeah, all the time. It's, I'm running, a, I got a negative comment on my ad. I think I should change everything. Sorry, like you're basing your whole business decision based on one troll as opposed to looking at the data. What about all those people who went through everything and maybe had a good experience? What about the fact that you're ROI positive on your ads? You're going to let one negative comment deter you. Never take advice from, never take criticism from someone you'd never take advice from. Like this, the thing with being online is you have to develop thick skin. No one, like no one's going to willingly come into your practice in person and say, you're a piece of shit. This is like, this is a scam. No one's going to say that to you in your face, but they can hide behind a computer and talk all the trash they want. You cannot engage with them. And it's as tempting as it is. You just have to like completely ignore the nonsense, like delete the comments. Don't give them any fuel, nothing. And I know that's not easy, but the, the whole thing, like I'll just share a quick uh, anecdotal story for me. So when I was in my late 20s, mid to late 20s, I had regrown all my hair. I kept my head shaved at that point. Eyebrows were back. Everything was back. And then when I was 31, and this is by this time, I had built a pretty significant health business. Uh, I took my son to the doctor while I was there. The doctor was like, hey, why don't you get a tetanus booster while you're here? And I was like, yeah, why not? And I got it. Two weeks later, all my hair fell out again. And I didn't oh, understand man. why until a while later. Anyways. So by that point, when that happened, what I started doing for two years is I started using my wife's makeup to paint on fake eyebrows every single morning mm. for two years. And it was the most exhausting charade I ever decided to partake in. And the only reason I did that was because of what people were going to think of me. If I had lost my hair again, now that I'm this health guy, what are they going to think of me? And for two years, I didn't want to go swimming. I didn't want to sweat while I was working out because what if it runs off? And if you see some of my older YouTube videos, like literally video to video, my eyebrows look different. It was, it was ridiculous. And I did that for two years. And then I got to a point where I just said, F this. I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm taking off the mask. And it is what it is. But that was one of the most, like, so you asked me earlier, like losing my hair when I was 17 must have been really hard. The, the scariest moment, to be honest, of my life, one of them at least, was when I decided to shoot a video that I was going to post on YouTube about my coming out. And it was like, hey, guys, here I am. Just want to let you know, here's what's going on. I was scared shitless to post. And this is like by this time I had, you know, 200,000 YouTube subscribers and I was scared out of my pants. I mean, I could have left the video on my camera. I didn't have to upload it, but I did. And... The thing that I realized on the flip side of that was how much it gave permission to others uh, for them to be themselves. Because I said, listen, like all of us are hiding behind some kind of veil of shame. And I'm just like, you know what? Screw this. Here's what's going on. Here's what I'm doing now. I'm not doing this, this nonsense anymore. And I had a lot of comments like, you know, man, you're beautiful the way you are, whatever. Um, and it was nice. Like it was touching and it, it, it was nice to see that it gave others permission to just be who they are and not, not to say that you can't improve, but like, stop trying to worry about what other people think of you. Cause if we live our lives like that, the, the reality is like most people don't have the life that I would want. So why would I care about what they say? And, but that's, that's easy to say. And it takes a long time, I think for a lot of us to get there. Right. It's like old, it's like, I don't know if I should share this, but like, you know, old men you see on, on like on the street, they're 75, 80 years old and they just fart as they walk by. They don't care. Right. Like I want to get to, maybe not to that point, but to a point where it's just like, who cares when you're sharing you in everything you do, whether it's social media content, whatever, I think the best thing we can all do is be the fullest version of ourselves because that's what really appeals to people. They want to see like the real you, not the, the like prim and proper or whatever, if, unless that's who you really are, which is fine. So, but that's hard, right? It's I, I like, this is where I work. It's, it's really cool to see clients that we work with evolve into like peeling back the layers of their onion so they can speak their truth and they can share their truth because there's always a tribe. There's always a group of people that are looking for someone they have affinity to. And if you don't share that true version of you, you may never find them. 
And that's why I think there is no competition. Like you and I kind of do the same thing, right? We serve a very similar audience, but we're also very different in how we present ourselves, which is amazing because you attract a certain audience. I attract a certain audience. And that's why I think there's more than enough for everyone. But if I try to be like you, I'd be screwed. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And, and that's the thing that I find as well is that people are so busy trying to be somebody else or something they're not. And that's a heavy lift every day, right? To get out of bed and, and have to, to really, you know, try to be something that you're not or be someone that you're not or, or see somebody who, who in your eyes might be uh, successful and then uh, you don't know their whole story either, right? My, my buddy tells me there's three sides to every story, right? There's their version, there's your version, there's something in between. So we don't even know what, what that person is experiencing on the other side of the camera. Yeah. And so it may not actually be what we actually want. So I, I fully agree with that. Be yourself, be your fullest self. And, um, you know, thank you for sharing that second part of your story. Uh, but it's beautiful to see the, the, what it led to. Right. And sure. yeah. what did, what did you notice? Like, uh, after, after that, like, uh, I'm sure there was like a, a weight lifted off of your chest and shoulders. Oh what happened in your business? To be honest, I wish I had a better recollection of exactly what happened, but I think for me, it was more just like the personal relief. Like it was really like I was, it, it felt like I was walking with a weighted vest on for a long time. And then I just took it off and I was like, oh my God, this felt so good. And it's actually pretty interesting how it happened. So I was at an events um, Awesomeness Fest by Mind Valley in um, the Dominican Republic. And so one night I had the eyebrows, had some conversations, had some epiphanies. The next morning I decided to toss the makeup. And I remember we're doing yoga on the beach and it started raining. And I was like, this is amazing. And it was like, I'm just laying in Shavasana and there's rain. I'm like, this is like, this wouldn't have happened a day ago. So I get out of the pose and we finish up and then I go into the ocean. I dive in, which again was something I probably would not have done. And I come out and I felt like I had just been like reborn. It was just so wow. cathartic and just so beautiful. And yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's all great. And I think, you know, our business only grows to the extent that we do. So I think, I don't know exactly the specific differences that it made, but I know that I wouldn't be where I am now had that not transpired. So I love that. Thank you. So many things I'm learning about you, man, that, uh, <laughs> that I didn't know it, it, uh, it's awesome to see that there's, uh, similarities in our journey and there's these unique experiences that you've had that have uh, really turned you into who you are. And it, it helps me understand when I see your posts on Facebook, when I see, uh, the ads that you're running now, I get a sense of where that fire, that drive, that passion, yeah. uh, to really be a value and service to people comes from. So thank you for taking us into those, uh, those aspects of your yeah, life pleasure. and your life experiences. Appreciate it. Now, one thing that uh, I, I've known about you is that you really financially kind of turned your life around and have created some, you know, uh, amazing impact. And with that comes uh, income, but it didn't always start that way. So I've heard there's a story about you being in like, you know, $55,000 of debt and you've kind of really turned that around. So maybe, maybe what are some of the blocks that you had or, um, you know, things that you can offer us that really, you know, helped you turn the corner and, and turn things around financially? So number one is I took some bad advice. Before I hired my first coach, I took some advice from someone I knew in the gym that I was working at who said, so this is just when I had started my first online product. It was a, a follow along workout, which was pretty cool at the time. And he's like, hey, you should, you should turn these into like CDs and sell them at trade shows. And I was like, that's an amazing idea. So what do we do? Uh, $35,000 credit line. Let's get all these. <laughs> this is when like CD players were still a thing. So I uh, spent $35,000 to turn a bunch of workouts into physical products. And then we spent another $20,000 to go to four trade shows across Canada and that whole thing was a complete massive waste of money. Hmm. However, there was some good learning there in terms of like selling stuff people want and whatever. But when you're when you're very early on in business, I mean, I'm a very high quick start. So I just do things. At the time, I didn't really think through it. I still move very quickly. And I'm I wouldn't say I'm impulsive. I, I'd say I'm intuitive, but I think when you have 20 years of experience in business, you can rely on your intuition a bit more because you have 
experience and context. At the time I had none. So I was just taking advice from anyone. So I had $55,000 net and inventory, like floor to ceiling of boxes that took up half our apartment. We lived in a tiny 800 square foot apartment and half the apartment was the boxes. And then we moved, the boxes came with us. We moved again. This is like over the period of 10 years, okay? And the inventory still came with us. And our third move, I see the boxes in our garage. And at this point, I'm like, you know what? It's been almost 10 years. I'm going to take these to the dump because I would have to ship them to a fulfillment center in the States. It would have cost me more money. I'm like, forget this. So I literally did a firehouse, like everything's got to go, but I didn't even sell it. I just took it to the dump and it was almost like the eyebrows, right? Just like a huge weight off my shoulders. The sunk cost is what it was. So I, I, I say to people, listen, like I haven't made the best financial decisions early on in my career and it's led me to paying a tremendous amount of money and interest, but I don't regret any of it because it's it's allowed me to get to where I am. And I have some really interesting and unique experiences that have allowed me to learn and grow from that. So, yeah, so I think knowing what I know now, if I look at that decision versus hiring a coach for $18,000, who at the time was more money than I made my previous year, that was an amazing decision. The difference was that when I invested $35,000 in products, I didn't build skills. When I invested with a coach, I did. And it's the same, like I was asking a bunch of clients the other day, I said, how many of you guys invest in the stock market? And everyone's like, oh, not everyone, but half the half the people raise their hand. I'm like, well, what kind of return do you guys get on average? It was like 10%, 9%, 12%. I'm like, if you invested $100,000 in a business coaching program, and you had a 12% return, you'd be pretty pissed. And everyone's like, I definitely would be. But here you are giving money to other companies you have no idea about, you have no control over, and hope for the best. What if you took that 100,000, I'm just using $100,000 as an example, but if you took that $100,000 and invested into a coach, business mentorship, whatever it is, and let's say worst case scenario, it was a scam. Like you lost all your money. It didn't work out. Worst case scenario, you'd probably leave with some skills if you showed up and did the work. If you lost all your money in the stock market, you leave with nothing. Unless you were a day trader and you learned how to trade stocks, whatever. Like you, you learn, you leave with nothing. And that's why when I when I look at when I when I ask practitioners, like you spent three hundred thousand dollars go to naturopathic college. Cool. Why did you do that? And they might say, well, I don't know, because I wanted to. I'm like, okay, well, why did you want to? Like, And eventually it comes down to so I could have the capability to help people and do my thing. Hmm. Amazing. So that tells me you're the type of person who values investing in your skills. And that's awesome. But now you have zero skills on the business side. Wouldn't it make more sense to invest in some of those so you could actually repay that debt and like get where you want to go? And like I, I have these conversations a lot because... It's weird that we'll spend so much money on formal education, yet do nothing to build our skills and business acumen, even though it's the single most powerful vehicle we have from an investment perspective. Like, I don't know about you, Sachin, but like if I invest or reinvest in my company in the form of, let's say, advertising, and I can turn a profit on that in 30 days, I'm not seeing that type of return anywhere. I mean, yeah. we live in Toronto and you might have a doubling of real estate in seven to 10 years, maybe. But if you could double in 30 days or a couple months with your business, like nothing comes close to that. And I just wish more people started to understand that. And I think where the discrepancy is, is they look at, well, what if this doesn't work out for me? Like, what if I lose my shirt working with this coach? And the way I look at that is like, well, that's on you. Because value is an extraction game. It's most often caught, not taught. And I think this is where I want to just call BS on, on some of this conversation around. There's a lot of like scam artists out there and so forth. We have a lot of mutual friends and they're all doing amazing work. And we have people that come to work with us who've worked with some of them previously. And when they say, well, I didn't have the best experience with so-and-so, I'm like, that's a bit of a warning flag for me. Because I'm like, honestly, you did that and that and, and you're still like poo-pooing and playing the victim maybe you're the common theme in both those scenarios. 
So why don't we like put on our big boy pants and take ownership of the fact that we didn't do shit or we gave up when it got tough or we actually didn't fully commit. That's where I think the biggest issue is like people not taking full ownership of their own results. And then they're looking for like, I need to know the guarantee. I need to have a guarantee for this. Great. Well, when you invested $300,000 in naturopathic college, what guarantee did they promise you? Uh, nothing. And why did you do it? So like, again, it's just like going back to like, you did it. Like, why is this any difference? Right. And it's just weird that we have these double standards and just ways of thinking about things that don't support us. And a lot of it comes down to fear. And I, I guess, you know, for me, coming back to what I said earlier on, I just, I, I do really think a lot of this comes down to very small thinking and small vision. If you just want to cover the bills, whatever, like it's nothing's going to make sense. But if you say you want to impact people's lives and you want to do something significant, you can't look at an investment in yourself and your business as like, this is too much. If you invest five, ta- five, 10,000, 30, whatever it is, like you have to understand that you will make that work if it's a must. Like that $18,000 I invested with my first coach, I was scared shitless. I'm like, I had to use two credit cards. I felt the butterflies in my stomach. But the thing was, and I remember my, I, I remember saying to myself, I'm like, uh, I got to figure this out no matter what. Because now I was in, right? It's like I was dropped into the ocean. I had to find a way to swim to shore. That's a great position to be in. Some people can't handle that. And, you know, we talked about this loosely earlier. You know, when you're looking at, do I have what it takes to be an entrepreneur? A lot of people don't, right? Because they get dropped off in the ocean and they swim a little bit and they're like, I'm cold. You know, my arms are tired. And it's like, well, you're about to get eaten by a shark. And they're like, yeah, I'll get eaten by the shark and I'll come back in the next life as, as whatever. In business, the thing is like, it is so friggin' hard. And I tell this in our, like I, sh- I share this in our market. I'm like, guys, like this is the hardest thing you will ever do by far, albeit a major health thing. Um, But the thing is like the payoff is so worth it. And where people get fixated is they get so hung up on the price instead of the payoff they're comfortable in their current situation as opposed to thinking about what their vision looks like. So when you, I use the example of like an elastic band, if you, if you stretch an elastic band a little bit, there's no, there's no energy there, but if you really stretch it and you create an in tension, there's a lot of power there. And I think a lot of people are just very small intentions and there's not enough energetic juice to get them out of bed in the morning to do whatever's needed to do that extra rep, to do that extra thing to get them to the next level. And I think if you if your vision is to cover the bills and make a bit of passive income, don't even bother. Just go work for someone else because it's too hard not to do something great. And the good thing is that there's so many mediocre businesses that it doesn't take that much to be a lot better than them, but you just have to have a bigger vision. Yeah, that's such a great point. And, and I like to highlight that for people is that, hey, uh, even when I'm doing a workshop, I'm like, listen, there's a hundred of you on this call and statistically less than five of you are going to do anything with what I shared today. So all the odds are stacked in your favor to learn this, to apply it. And it's not even about outworking the other person that that shouldn't be what drives you. But uh, like you just, you can let go of that thought that, oh my God, everyone's learning this and they're going to outwork me. Statistically, most people won't. Uh, I love your thoughts on just kind of unpacking the entrepreneurship thing a little bit more. Who do you feel uh, or what, what are maybe some uh, common themes that come up for people who can identify as being uh, entrepreneurial in their spirit? Or what are some things that pe- that come up for people who maybe you've identified are not good at entrepreneurship? Yeah. Have you identified certain characteristics? Uh, big time. Yeah, for me, I don't even care about their business experience. I care about their traits because I can talk to someone in one minute. I'll know if they're going to succeed or not. I'll give you an example. So one of our clients came to us at the beginning of 2020, just before the pandemic. And I said, hey, man, I think you're a bit early. And he's like, no, watch me. He was making 800 bucks a month. And in a year and a half, he built a multiple seven-figure business. Same coaching, same strategy, but he crushed it. And it's like, I could say, well, it's because of us. I mean, sure, but he was the type of person to get the most value out of it. And I could tell really quickly with someone like, yes, you have to be an expert in our space. Like that's, we'll just kind of put that aside. 
if you do not have self-confidence, like self-belief, you're toast. If you don't believe in yourself, go work for someone else. Like don't even start, just pack it up, go make lattes, whatever. <laughs> like if you don't believe in yourself, here's the thing, no one else is going to. Like you are, the the odds are so stacked against you in business that you have to have, I call it delusional optimism. You have to have this like persistent thinking of like, I will make this work. Things are going to work out for me. The universe is supporting me. It's all good. And most people don't. And they freak out when there's a little, you know, a hurdle in the road or whatever it is. So that self-belief is really important. The second thing is drive. We talked about having a vision. If you have a small vision, like it's, again, it's forget about it. It's not even worth it. There's just like, if you think of a rocket ship leaving the earth, there's so much energy required to get it out of orbit. It's the same thing with business. You know, like, it's like if you had a rocket ship that was only going to go from here to 10,000 feet, like, why would you even bother? Like, it's just going to come right and fall. So you have to have a big vision and that, that might scare some people because they don't know what it looks like at that level. It's like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to make too much money because if, if I do, it's because I'm working with too many clients. And if I'm working with too many clients, it means I have no time in my life. And that's because they're thinking from the frame of what they're currently in, right? But it's it doesn't mean that you can't change the model. Like there are people out there that are working with thousands of clients at the same time, impacting more lives. But I, I really want to make sure that every one of my clients gets love in it. I'm like, cool, you can keep telling yourself that story. It's going to keep you know keeping you small. If you want to stay there, amazing. So I think the drive is very important. The self-belief is massively important. And the other thing is just having a growth mindset. It, like being humble and coachable is really important. Like as, as, as much success and as many, many more failures as I've had, I realized like I am not smart enough to get to the next level. Like I have to get out of my own way because you as the business owner become the cog in the machine because you will delegate last what you're best at doing. So for me, it's marketing. And the very fact that I've held on to marketing for so long is the very reason that we haven't grown to where we want to grow yet. And coming to the realization, like I'm humble enough, like I'm obviously I have confidence. Like I really believe I'm good. I know that. But I am also very humble to recognize I'm not good enough. And there are other people that are way smarter than me in certain verticals that I just have to get out of their way and allow them to drive the bus. There are many practitioners in health who are like, I have this really special way of doing things that only I can do. No one else can do it. Okay, great. Have fun with that for the rest of your life. Or, you know, I'm not, I'm not open to feedback or taking coaching, or I, I really want to put my thing out this, this way. And it's like, no one cares about it. If you put it out that way, you probably have to wrap it in this type of wrapping paper. And then you can give it to them on the inside like that. Well, no, I don't really want to like, dude, we're giving you the recipe for chocolate cake. If you swap the eggs for chia seeds, I can't give you the same results. So I think the coachability and being humble is important. That drive and the self-belief are really three big traits that we look at. When should somebody throw in the towel? So there's probably lots of people that uh, have given it the old college try, so to speak. And you know, maybe it's not working out. Like, what Do they need a coach? Do they need to throw in the towel? What? Do they need a new belief system? Like where, where, what's that next step for them? Yeah, that's, that's a hard question to answer. I think you have to be so committed to the vision you want to build because for me, it's like, I, I would never, never ever consider throwing the towel because I'm so committed to the vision that I have and what I'm doing and the purpose I'm here to do. I don't care if a friggin' meteor like fell on the, fell on my house or, or the business blew up or whatever. Like I would be, I mean, for me, I can't just sit on a beach and do nothing. Like I have to, I think if you're an entrepreneur at your core, it's, we definitely want freedom, right? We want the freedom to choose, have choice, have options, but it doesn't mean lay on a beach. Mm -hmm. It means I get to do what I want to do with whom I want to do. Like, and, and for me, I work more now than I did when I was a burnt out personal trainer, but I love my work. And I, and I wake up at four in the morning and I just, I get to it. It's, it's the best. So I think you have to be really like so connected to what you're doing beyond the money. Like it's not about the money and like, yeah, money, you can use it as a scorecard and you can have some cool stuff along the way, but it's about 
whatever it's important, whatever's important to you. For me, it's like, it's the growth of who I get to become as I go through this journey. So if we want to build a billion dollar business, I don't care about the money. It's who do I get to become in that journey? That's what I get excited about. What are the challenges that I can't yet overcome? What are the problems I don't yet know how to solve that I will be able to solve? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are very growth oriented and we relish that growth and that contribution. So, you know, I don't I don't know if it's so much of like throwing the towel as opposed to maybe throw in the towel here and pivot this way. And I think sometimes, but again, there's a very strong caution there because the grass, the grass is not greener on the other side. It's greener to where we water it. But sometimes it's hard to know without discernment and context if what you're doing isn't working because no one cares about it. Like it just there's no product to market fit or um, you just haven't given it enough time. I see a lot of people want to switch niches or whatever. I'm like, dude, you're just going to deal with the same stuff in a different vertical. It's, it doesn't matter. Like you have to go through the levels like uh, like Mario Brothers, right? So if you are if you're committed to living a great life and contributing in a big way, and you know in your core that you're unemployable and that you can you have ideas that you want to bring to life, you I think you have to pursue that, and then you'll run into challenges. And as long as you're able to make decisions, take action, and then quickly pivot, like if like something doesn't make sense, okay, if you can have mentorship and guidance so you can avoid some of those potholes and have conversations to be like, hey, Sachin, like, I've been at this for a while. What do you think? Like having those conversations can definitely help as well. Um, but I think it's, you've got to have the fire in the belly, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't know if enough people have that. You know, speaking of entrepreneurship, I, I saw a post that you did. Um where you're, it's a picture of you next to a picture, a famous, very famous picture of Steve Jobs. I think it's a cover of his autobiography, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And so I'm assuming you're a big fan of, of Steve. Uh, who are some of the other entrepreneurs that you admire? And, and maybe there's a, uh, books that you suggest or people that uh, that inspire you that I, I, I always, I'm always curious about that because yeah. it clues me in, into the way you think as well. So I don't know if I admire anyone in the fullest version, uh, like the, the holistic version of that person. So for instance, mm. like Steve Jobs um, could be seen as a tyrant in, right, some, right. in some conversations. Uh, but I, I think there's there's aspects of him that I admire, which is this relentless pursuit of high standards and excellence. I love that about him. Everything else, I'm not too sure about. I don't know him personally. I don't know what his family life was like. Um, you know, Richard Branson, I, I love and admire his ability to take risk and think big and challenge the status quo. How he is as a family man, his relationships, I don't know. So I share that because I don't know if like, if I have one person as a reference who has the whole package, because for me, success is not about money. It's like, I'm very grateful that I spent a lot of time with my kids I work at home. I see my wife all the time. I'm, I'm, my health is awesome. I feel fitter now than I did in my 20s. All of that stuff is important to me. And I don't know if I have a single reference point for someone like that, but I take elements of mm -hmm. like um, Novak Djokovic, right? Like the best tennis player of all time, just won the US Open this past weekend. The guy's like physically toast on the court and he finds a way to win. And like to see like what he's gone through in his life coming from war torn Serbia and dealing with that, like, the resilience he's built as a person and seeing it, I don't understand. Like he's out of the top tennis players. He's probably the one that people like the least. And I think this guy's the most spiritually evolved and the most generous and the nicest. And for some reason, I don't think he gets the love he deserves. I have a tremendous amount of respect for people like that. So I look at great athletes like him, like Tom Brady. I like the process. Right. I like the Kobe's who go to, you know, do two workouts a day instead of one um, because everyone's so focused on like the veneer, the, the outcome. I want to know, like, what's the process? Like Mr. B started doing YouTube when he was 13. He ate crap for like nine of those years. And then he became Mr. B as we know him. But the thing is, people don't recognize the obsession he had every single day of learning about YouTube and the thumbnails and the creative aspect. And it's like, oh, like here's this guy in his twenties who's, you know, like the biggest influencer on the planet. It didn't just happen. Like he went through a journey of a decade 
And it just so happens he started at 13 instead of at 30. So I, I really, really admire people who commit to the process because I think that's where greatness lies. And if more people understood that and really relished the journey, the highs and lows, and this is why I do my best to be very realistic with people. It's like, listen, like working, if you're to work with us, it's not going to be easy. There'll be moments where you hit your head against the wall. You, there'll be moments where you may want to give up. There'll be nights where you don't sleep well, but I promise you we'll be with you every step of the way. And it'll be the best decision you ever make for yourself. But I'm not going to sit here and say like, you're going to make a million dollars tomorrow. It's going to be the easiest thing ever because expectations have to be set properly. And if people are coming in, it's like if you worked out expecting it to be easy and with no soreness, and then you woke up the next morning and you couldn't walk, you'd be pretty pissed. So I think being transparent is super valuable in that context. But nonetheless, um, just to kind of bring this full circle, I, I look at people I admire in different aspects of their life, right? So whether it's a family man or, or a business person or, you know, how people approach their product or I take elements of different people. Um, and that's kind of how I've pieced what I think success looks like in my life. If that amazing, hopefully. I, no, I love that. I love that response. And, and, uh, it kind of reminds me of something that I tell people as well is that, you know, if you, if you're, if you look up to someone, admire them for lack of better term, uh, admire them for the whole person, right. Or, or, you know, not just the, the parts that you see, the veneer that you see, as you described. So yeah, we can piece together that perfect person, the perfect family man, the perfect entrepreneur, the visionary, the risk taker, all the different archetypes and, and learn from them, learn from their experiences, learn from their downfalls and mistakes they've made yeah. uh, along the way. Um, here, a couple more questions. I, 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 um, I'm quite curious what, uh, you're up at 4am. So I, I'd love to, if you would just walk us through, uh, what your day looks like. So sure. people get a sense of, you know, uh, what it takes to, to win here. So I'll just share like what my current day looks like, and it's, it's evolved over time. So in our previous house, uh, we had a gym in the garage. I converted a freezer into a cold plunge. So I started my day at four right in the cold plunge and I loved it. Our current house doesn't have the same setup, so I don't do that. And it's, um, it's something I miss, and we're obviously looking at kind of resurrecting that. So what I do is I get up at four, come down, drink basically a whole one of these of water, and then um, I get into work. I just actually started that, and I review my vision. So I have a, I don't have my phone on me, but I have an app on my phone where I have all my, my goals and my visuals, like visualization stuff, and I review that for about five minutes first thing in the morning. I want to connect to my big vision and my one-year goals. I review that actually three times a day, but first thing in the morning, uh, instead of like going on Instagram as an example. So I have to be very disciplined around that because it's on the phone. Once I've done that, it's like right to the computer and I get right into my most important work. And I've gone through periods of time where I did some journaling and some reading first thing, but I know for me, my most important work is done first thing. So I have focused time between 4.30ish and about eight in the morning. And I try to turn off all the distractions and it's really just me in a Google Doc, right? Or me in a notepad thinking through some thought leadership stuff or some frameworks or product improvements. And that's what the first couple hours of my day looks like. Um, my kids obviously are back at school now. So between like eight and nine, it's just kind of hanging with them. I don't really walk them to school anymore because they don't really want me to. Like they're on their bikes and they just they're like, see you later. I'm like, oh, I kind of miss walking you guys to school. Um like, Grab a bike and bike with them. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I could. It's, but I actually like moving my body walking wise. But yeah. Um, so usually, like, I might walk to school, even though they're like a kilometer ahead of me, just like in my walk in. And then after that, um, I might have a bit more work I'm doing in the morning. Uh, Mondays, I do all my meetings. Uh, Wednesdays, I have a few in the afternoon. So typically, like, from morning until about 11 a.m., that's just like my focus time. 11 a.m. until about three or four. It's meetings, not every day, but about two days of the week. I'll do some interviews like this. And I just like taking time to get outside, work out. I mean, I work out 45 minutes every day. I walk or run five kilometers every day. I stretch every single day. So like activity is a very important part of my, my daily routine. 
um, minimum 30 minutes of learning, which is like, it's usually more than that, but minimum 30. So I'm reading, listening to podcasts or audios, something to grow my mind and, and doing my best to support outside of like coaching my clients a couple times a week, uh, spending time coaching my team and looking at how we can continually elevate the business with amazing people, support them, level them up. And that's pretty much what it looks like. And then, you know, around this time or a little bit later, it's family time, make some dinner, uh, take the kids to soccer, you know, do stuff like that. So it's a very, I live a very, like, I don't really, I don't think my life is like that glamorous. It's very boring, but I love it. I, I get a lot of joy out of that routine. I like just looking at trees in my backyard, going for a walk. I, I get a lot of pleasure out of stuff like that. So that's what my, my routine typically looks like. I love that. Simple to the point. You don't need this, you know, extravagant morning routine to get down and and eat the frog, as Brian Tracy would say. Do yeah. that. Uh, do that. You know, sometimes that difficult thing that most people tend to put off. Just get it out of the way. Do it first thing in the day. And uh, you know, good luck with the ice plunge, man. I know it's starting to get cold here in uh, in Ontario. So oh, that's the best. I, uh, so our pool, my wife likes to keep warm, and now it's like getting a little bit colder. So I'm like, babe, turn the heater down. Because now I can actually use the pool as a little bit of a cold plunge first thing in the morning. So I told the pool company, we can close the pool like mid-November. But in the meantime, keep it open. I'm going every morning. Let's have some fun. Oh, that's awesome. There's actually a uh, way off topic here. But since you since uh, we're talking about pools, there is a compound that you can add to your pool that keeps it uh, accessible to you throughout the season. So you can hmm. actually use your pool in the winter as well. Wow. So, so it keeps it at like a certain temperature without well, over not, not, not temperature, but the chemistry of the pool. Like the, okay. when they win, when they winterize your pool, sometimes they put uh, uh, stabilizers in there that aren't so good for us, but there's yeah. actually a compound that you can use that. I think it's called ocean that you can put in the pool. So you could use it as a cold plunge throughout the winter. Nice. Uh, if you good want to, to you just got to peel back the, the cover, of course. Nice. That's good to know. Awesome, man. Well, I, I see your kids are home. Uh, so I that means it's, it's, uh, it's family time. Uh, same with me. My son just walked in. So thank you, man. This has been so enlightening. I, I, I took notes. I'm going to go back and watch this interview. And for all of you that are tuning in, whether you're watching the video or watching or listening to the audio, uh, go back. There's, there's a lot of nuggets. And I feel like this is one of those conversations that you could watch even 30 days from now and you'll pick up something different. It's like a uh, it's like one of those movies you pick up a little detail because you're a different version of yourself. Uh, Yuri, what, what's the best place for people to learn more about you, follow the work that you're doing, maybe even get in contact with you? Um, well, if you're listening to podcasts, we have a podcast called The Healthpreneur Show on iTunes, Spotify, uh, all that all that jazz. Um, I think you've been on the show a couple, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, which was awesome. And other than that, the best place is just uh, touch base with me on Instagram. I'm at healthpreneur. And then obviously I post a lot of stuff on YouTube, but um, yeah, those are probably the best places. Thanks, man. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll be in touch. We'll set up a time to connect and, and hang out in person a bit more. Um, I love, I love traveling places and meeting cool people, but there's so many cool people right in our own backyard. So yeah. let's make it a point to connect this season. hundred percent. Thanks for having me, man. My pleasure. Talk to you soon.